What's going on everybody and welcome back to the Combat Cast and here is a special segment I call Combat Cast 1v1. Today I have a special guest, New Zealand MMA fighter, coach and model, Jack Ferguson. Thank you for having me Bert, it's great to be here. Good to have you. All right Jack, so you're from New Zealand but you've been in Thailand for how long now? I've been here maybe five or six years now. Right. But how long have you been in Bangkok? Because I've heard you, you told me already that you've spent time in other provinces, mm -hmm. right? Right. Uh, it's been a couple months in Phuket, two or three years in Chiang Mai, and I've been here maybe two or three years in Bangkok now. All right, so where do you currently train out of? Uh, right now I'm training and coaching at Maroc. All right. Uh, Maroc gym, it's a new gym opened up in Rama 3, uh, focusing mostly on MMA. What gyms, so what gyms did you like spend your time at, you know, in those other provinces before, Mar before you came to Maroc? So uh, we, when I was training in Chiang Mai, I trained at Team Quest, which is like an old American style gym. Uh, we built a really solid team there and COVID kind of uh, made the gym fall apart. And yeah. so uh, very fortunately, we were able to relocate our team to Maroc here in Bangkok and we started our own new facility uh, facility where I'm now coaching too. So I've seen, I've like done some re background research on you. You fought, you know, kind of around the world. You know, you've done your fighting in Australia, China, and now in Thailand. How would you, you know, make comparisons between like fighting in Thailand and like in, you know, those other countries? Mm -hmm. uh, it's super interesting, bro, here in Thailand. Uh, it's kind of like the Wild West. <laughs> you tell. Uh, so, for the promotions that I fought on, the lower level Muay Thai shows in Chiang Mai, for example, um, you're just fighting in a field. Like, one of them I fought on the Loi Tong Festival. It's just a ring in the middle of a paddock. And in between rounds, I was like, uh, I was quite tired, I'm trying to catch my breath, and these guys are lighting fireworks right beside the corner. So my coach was like, deep breath, and I'm like, <coughs> Start coughing because like, there's so the much smoke. like smoke. Yeah. <laughs> and um, for the majority of the lower level Muay Thai events, they don't really check your weight. So the first time uh, I was fighting, I think at 60 kilos, I walk around 70, 75. So I cut a bunch of weight to make weight. And then I, I was like, when are the weigh ins? Like, oh, right before the fight. So I was like, oh, kind of dehydrated and whatever. And then the promoter was like, scales over there, go check your weight. Okay. And I check, I come back. He's like, okay, cool. And I was like, you're not gonna check anything? He's like, no, it's all right. I was like, oh, okay. And then bro was way bigger than me. I was like, ah, oh, he didn't cut anything. <laughs> they just did like the, this one, you know, oh, same size. Oh, same size. And then they like it. hold your arms like, oh, <laughs> they, they feel the same, right? <laughs> I feel like they do that for like a lot of the child fights, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how did that fight go? Do you remember? I got 19 stitches in my face, so. <laughs> do you remember how much you got paid? Uh, for that fight, oh, not much at all. I think like three, three and a half thousand baht. <laughs> for perspective, for anyone watching, that's like about a hundred US dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Damn, man. Um, so like, but what about like Muay Thai? You know, you told, you let it, you, you let me in on your thoughts about Muay Thai scoring. You know, you mm -hmm. were not too happy about it. So what was that all about? So my understanding of the traditional Muay Thai scoring here in Thailand is that uh, punches to the head don't really score points. And so I can punch you three or four times in the face hard. And if you kick my leg on the break, you're winning. You're up on points as far as I understand. And so there have been some fights that I've watched uh, of either myself or my friends and they'll throw three or four beautiful piece combo, boom wobble the guy a bit and the guy just one knee to the body one knee to the leg leg kick and they're like okay that guy won he's up on points which i don't necessarily see like if we're fighting it, they should prioritize damage punching in the head is the most damaging therefore it should in my opinion should score the most but again i'm not a muay thai guy and yeah. so my opinion on muay thai is kind of vague i don't really fight muay thai anymore but uh I feel the Western way of scoring kickboxing where they score aggression and punches to the head and damage, I think is far more 
appealing and uh, fan friendly too. I agree, cause like, so like based on my limited knowledge of like combat sports, mm -hmm. basically punches don't score anything, right? In Muay Thai. Mm -hmm. That's actually kind of sad. It's uh, if I wobble you, if I hit you and you stumble back, okay, I scored a point. But if you kick me on the way out, it's even. So unless I drop you, and like put a count on you, the punches don't matter. <laughs> you know, like even as a, as a non-fighter, I just think that it's just best you, you go for the finish. Mm -hmm. Even then it's gonna make like the gamblers unhappy, right? Mm -hmm. Cause you, did you, do you go to like, do you fight in places with the gambling venues? Yeah. The other thing too is uh, Muay Thai fights at five rounds, right? Yeah. The first two rounds, is a spectacle because yeah. they want to encourage people to place bets and to gamble. So the first two rounds they have off and they fight hard round three and four. Yeah. And usually there's a clear victor by round three or four. Yeah. And so round five, they're like, we don't need to hurt each other anymore. Oh, and they, they, where they go like, okay, ah, peace. Yeah, they just play around and dance and stuff like that because they probably have to fight again in a couple days. Yeah. And so they're not trying to hurt each other anymore and they know who won. So realistically, out of a five round fight, you're fighting two rounds. Yeah, which is why three round Muay Thai is more like appealing, mm -hmm. especially to like people my age and below, mm -hmm. your age and my age and below. Cause like in three round Muay Thai, you're like, you're fighting all three rounds, you're giving it your all. You're expected to go full aggression. Like, and if you get, if you like try and backpedal, try to dance, the referee gives you a warning. I think that's the other thing too, is um, in terms of appealing to the crowd, majority of people that like to spectate, uh, majority of spectators, sorry, they, they don't want to watch a five minute Y crew, two rounds of nothing, another round of dancing at the end, and then prayers and stuff. They just want to, I want to watch the fight. The Y crew, yeah, the Y crew, I feel like it, it doesn't do good for televised Muay Thai because mm -hmm. like it takes up so much airtime. Mm. And I watched an interview with, with uh, Prem, you, you probably know him, Prem mm -hmm. from Fairtex. He mm -hmm. said like, he was trying to like explain why one like uh, was omitting the Y crew and they were only like doing Y crew for like certain fights mm -hmm. because they, he was like trying to say, you have to understand that we are wasting the um, network's valuable time. So we can't do a Y crew every fight. Mm -hmm. And like also like the audience is actually here to watch a fight. Mm -hmm. which I totally agree with. Like, the company that I used to work with. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just gonna air it right now. I used to not say it before. Thai Fight, Thai mm -hmm. Fight, I used to work with them. Mm -hmm. They have three round fights, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes like, it wouldn't go past the first round. Right. But the Y crew takes five minutes. Mm -hmm. And not to mention the fighters' entrances. Mm -hmm. Three, three minutes each tops. Mm -hmm. So like, if you're watching on television, I feel so bad for you because like, oh man, it takes up so much time. They're like, there's more, there's more time being spent on like entrances, Y crew, than there is fight time. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about the idea that a lot of the time that you're on the screen, it should be as entertaining as possible? How do you think that uh, people should capitalize on their time while they're on the screen? Well, I mean, I mean, as a fighter, Oh, that's difficult in, in Thai, in, in the Thai circuit anyways. It's hard, you know, it's really hard, especially like where I worked, man, they only promote the guys that they want to promote. We have, we, they had a lot of like uh, big names, Sanchai included, mm -hmm. uh, and Bokhao at the time, like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. But like they only promoted those guys. Say if there was like a, a foreigner, an expat training in Thailand who was like booked to fight someone like San Chai or one of the Thai guys signed under contract with Thai Fight. Those, those guys, I guarantee you would never get a chance mm -hmm. to promote themselves. Although I heard stories uh, the year before I came to work with Thai Fight. So one of my colleagues, one of my senior colleagues, uh, she got in touch with like this fighter from Australia. She told me he seemed like a really hippie type, mm -hmm. almost as if he was like high mm -hmm. all the time. He was booked to fight San Chai. Mm -hmm. um, but like his entrance song apparently was like from a mixtape of his friends. I don't know, I don't know what kind of music it was. Must be some kind of hippie music. And apparently 
he was told like, bro, you have to cut down on your entrance because it's taking so long. And apparently he was really like, um, how do you say, flamboyant with his entrance. Mm -hmm. Also, it took up a lot of the, like, because they had to go through rehearsals too, mm -hmm. you see. And they had to rehearse the entrances and the Y crew. This dude was like, I mean, in retrospect, I think he was trying to like promote himself mm -hmm. in his own way. Mm -hmm. Whether it was through his like, of unorthodox entrance and his unorthodox Y crew. But the company was basically telling him, you, bro, you need to cut this down, you need to cut this down. It's taking up too much time. Mm -hmm. But in a company like that, yeah, it's really difficult to promote yourself. I think in terms of screen time, it's damn near impossible for a mm -hmm. fighter, especially an expat or a foreigner, to promote themselves. I think ultimately it's it's up to them. Do it on like social media, on their mm -hmm. own social media. like. Hey, I'm gonna fight on Thai Fight this weekend. Mm -hmm. Promote me. Like, don't forget to come support me, whether on YouTube, whether at ringside, mm -hmm. this and that. Make YouTube videos if you can, if you have a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's all the advice I can give. Having worked in like a Thai business, in the fight business, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think that it's up to the fighter to market themselves because a lot of people don't realize that fighting is entertainment. Yeah. We're in the entertainment industry. Exactly. Whether it's, you know, we're not singing or dancing or things like this, but we make money from people knowing us and wanting to come and watch us perform. Right. And so I think that there's a very important aspect that a lot of fighters miss is it's not just about being the best fighter. Yeah. Obviously that's number one. You have to win your fights and you have to right. train and you know market yourself properly. But at the same time, you don't make money from fighting. Yeah. You make money from being the fighter. Sponsors, endorsements. Yeah. Commercial. I've made more money in the last year from commercials than I have from fighting. I'm not surprised. You know what I mean? And so, <laughs> which is great. So I think that's something that people need to consider. And I'm not saying that you have to be as flashy as style bender or smoking weed like Sugar Sean or something like this. Or doing coke and like being drunk and making like, <laughs> yeah, explicit, tw uh, like expletive tweets like Connor, but yeah. yeah. But th they're great examples and people say, people wonder, why does Connor get to pick who he fights? Why does Sugar Sean get to pick who he fights? Because money, they they're the in, ones they that rake the in the money. So the promotion wants to sponsor these guys. I feel like in Thailand, they don't follow that kind of business model. Mm -hmm. They. I don't know if it's like they believe in ethics and morals. Like mm -hmm. we don't want to have a vulgar fighter fighting for us. It's dishonorable. Mm -hmm. I mean, in hindsight, yes, I hate the guy, but Dave LaDuc, has he done damage on like left way from Myanmar? I mean, it's debatable. I mean, he has tainted the sport, yeah. Mm. I mean, he he's, he's commercialized, he's popularized left way, yes. But he's taken away all the, shall we say yeah the traditions and values mm -hmm. so i'm not going to drop any names but like uh a little bird told me mm -hmm. that you know the so there's this traditional leg tattoos mm -hmm. in myanmar mm -hmm. kind of like the satyan mm -hmm. that you do which it requires like this ritual this praying you have to be in a tent for like three four days i forget um and dave laduke apparently uh, allegedly he just used a freaking tattoo gun and got it done in like <laughs> one day. So yeah, he even corrupted like that, you know, sacred tattoo ritual from Myanmar. Mm. It's supposed to be a rite of passage thing, but he just like took the shortcut apparently. Mm -hmm. That is one thing that I see the difference between the UFC and for example, one championship. Yeah. The UFC promotes the UFC. Yeah. They promote UFC 298, 300, but like the event. Whereas when I see one, the way they market is they market the fighters. So you see Stamp Fair Tex, Rod Tang. If you look at Instagram, every second post is Stamp, Stamp. Highlights of Stamp. Like, and, you're, and they do that to make these superstars. Yeah. Which I, I agree with because it's not giving one championship the monopoly over fighters. Yeah. It's, they treat fighters well and they want fighters to compete in the organization and make the fighter as popular as possible. Whereas the UFC wants to maintain control, maintain the monopoly, and that's why they said after Conor left, yeah, or after Conor started coking out and doing his thing, they're like, no more superstars. Yeah, because I feel like the main. UFC has now become like, it has a corporate feel to it, you know? Mm. The fighters are disguised in like, 
suits, mm -hmm. so to speak. You know, they're right. like all uniform guys. Like the Venom, the Venom shorts are their uniforms. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, before back in like a decade ago, let's say, they ha they were allowed their own uh, fight wear. They could wear whatever they wanted. They could wear sponsor patches mm -hmm. and all that. But now they have so many restrictions. They can't wear sponsor patches. They're not allowed to have these sponsors cause mm -hmm. crypto.com, Monster Energy and uh, Modelo Beer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just so much has changed in terms of like the permissiveness mm -hmm. of like. Ooh. That's the other thing too is uh, originally it was the Reebok deal and then the Venom deal yeah. instead. Um, that was a big reason of why some of the other fighters were leaving. Like for example, George St. Pierre, he used to get $800,000 per fight from Under Armour. Yeah. And he's only getting half a million to fight. So he's making more from one sponsor and he had multiple sponsors. Yeah. And then the Reebok deal came in and said, no more sponsors, but GSP will give you five grand. Five grand from Reebok. He's like, well, what the hell? I just made 800,000, now I'm getting 5,000. So he retired shortly after. Because good for him. <laughs> that's the other thing I was saying is, you don't make money from fighting. The fight purse is smaller than one sponsorship. Yeah. He had 10 sponsors. The other thing with the Reebok deal or Venom deal is on fight week, in the embedded videos on your Instagram, you're not allowed to promote other brands. Yeah. So you can have sponsors outside and stuff, but fight week, you're not allowed to promote anything. Nothing on the UFC camera can be anything other than monster opinion. I feel like that's the case in America, just in all of American fighting, because I forget what podcast this was on. This was, and this, this isn't the UFC. Mm. This is like between Jake Paul and Logan Paul. This was the night of his, this was like about his, Jake Paul's fight with uh, Nate Diaz. Mm. So you know Logan Paul is doing his prime hydration thing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but the fight, that Jake Paul had with Nate Diaz is actually sponsored by Celsius Energy. Mm. I don't know exactly what it d is because it's not available here in Thailand. Mm -hmm. But basically, like, the venue was banning Jake, sorry, ba the venue was banning Logan from bringing, like, prime bottles or cans into the, vi into the area because, like, it's Celsius. It has to be Celsius only. And mm. Logan was being such a bitch about it. <laughs> but, like, yeah, I feel like, the sponsorship culture is so strong there. Mm. But yeah, I definitely agree. But that's another big thing is, um, speaking of Jake Paul, I think that he's one of the first celebrity boxer, YouTube boxers, that's actually made the transition to fighting real guys. I know you can say, oh, they were old, they were retired, they weren't boxers, they were wrestlers. Like, right. Which is all valid points, however, He's the first celebrity boxer, YouTube boxer, to fight. Like, Tyron Woodley's one of the best welterweights ever. Ben Askren, one FC champ. Anderson Silva, one of the greatest of all time. Yeah. They were older, retired, smaller, whatever. He had all the advantages. He played his books. But he played it smart. And he made big fights and made a lot of money. But he's the first YouTube boxer, celebrity boxer that's actually having real fights. So there's no headgear, there's no 16 ounce gloves and nonsense yeah. like this. He's not one of these like fake Instagram gurus trying to masquerade as a fighter. He's having real fights. So for Jake, someone like that, I respect. But um, what do you think about the difference between, like, what is the fine line between a fighter promoting himself versus an Instagram guy pretending to be a fighter? difference could be, not be any more like that could not be any more obvious like if if I were to watch like if I had to watch real footage like you'd be able to tell right away like say an Instagram influencer or a da -ra -da -ra, an actor mm -hmm. an actor was like participating in a celebrity boxing match mm -hmm. in Thailand okay we're already doing cele that celebrity boxing shit here mm -hmm. in Thailand your looks are the number one priority. Fuck safety, your mm -hmm. looks. Mm -hmm. You know what they do? They put on headgear. Mm -hmm. So there's this, there's this program called 10 Fight 10. I don't know if you've heard it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's, yeah, there's, so they pick a lot of like, uh, shall we say? Like pretty boys. Pretty boys, <laughs> six pack abs, washboard abs. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and they just pick them to fight. And uh, you know, like nine times out of 10, they, when you watch their fight, the actual fights, it's horrible. It hurts. It's atrocious, yeah. It really hurts. <laughs> like, I wouldn't recommend it. But there will be that one in like 100, that that one guy who's like, who actually shows to a form who, okay, you watch and you see, 
and you think, okay, this guy's trained in boxing. This mm -hmm. guy has done, he's done his homework. Mm -hmm. But what I do take issue with, one guy, uh, he won his fight, uh, but like, to be fair, his opponent was, his background was in, get this, basketball. Mm -hmm. but, okay, he was tall and handsome. Both guys were tall and handsome. Anyway, what I took issue with after winning his fight, uh, which during which I think he also injured his hand or something. After his in his post fight interview, he just boldly takes the mic. He's like, "After this, I can say now that I'm a professional boxer." That was the moment I decided to roll my eyes, man. Uh, it's like that's insulting. Yeah, it's insulting <laughs> to all the boxers who make significantly less money mm. as an from than you as an actor. Okay, because like, dude, you were wearing headgear. Mm. Okay, and like. In ten fight ten, they do mo like most of the show. The time is allotted to like build ups, mm -hmm. hypes, interview, training footage behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Like, if the show is like say one hour, mm -hmm. it's like forty five minutes of mm -hmm. like build up, and then fifteen minutes is the fight. Barring like it finishes, it ends in a knockout. There are. Uh, speaking of ten fight ten, I know two guys that I coach personally. Yeah, they can actually box. Yeah, Anon and Poppy. I was I was there helping them for I was yeah those guys the yeah those are the few guys they can yeah. actually box yeah but I do understand like um a lot of these other guys it's a spectacle yeah it's he's a famous guy boxing's an exciting sport yeah if it was a running race or the basketball match you think anyone would watch no fighting's the most exciting sport yeah and so that's why it captivates so much attention because it's natural it's evolutionary yeah like I think that uh. If the world started completely from zero, from atoms again, and we had to re-evolve, basketball might not exist, soccer, tennis wouldn't exist, fighting would be there. Fighting would still exist, because combative... Instinct, Whether it's wrestling or boxing, yeah. Some form of combative physicality would be, would exist, would be yeah. a sport, you know? And so, um, that's why I think like, subconsciously, everyone understands fighting, or everyone's at least somewhat interested in fighting. Yeah. Can you name any tennis guys, any bo like basketball, any like hockey? N no. But everyone knows fighters because it's the most captivating sport. Right. And I think because you get so much prestige from being a fighter, I think a lot of people, they want that. They want that prestige. They want to masquerade as a fighter or something yeah. like this too. Which is, which is why like it's sometimes getting out of control now. You've got these content creators in the US that are mm -hmm. like, Oh, now I'm fighting now. Yeah, like Misfits Boxing. Uh, uh, what, what, what's the other one? Creator Clash with all the YouTubers fighting. And like mm -hmm. some of, okay, there are some guys who, I'm pretty sure they're self-aware that they can't fight. They're just doing it for fun, for the awareness. Mm -hmm. But like, what concerns me more is that there's actually some people in Thailand who are like pulling that shit here now. Mm -hmm. and, like, we actually had one of those at my old company in Thai Fight, and I, mm -hmm. at first I didn't know that the guy was a, he was just a, an influencer, but like, when I arrived at the company, like, one of my senior colleagues was like, don't you know who that guy is? He's an influencer, and he sh she shows me the Instagram feed, and she has like, I don't know, 10,000, 100,000 fucking followers, mm -hmm. and I, I didn't realize at the time, but looking back, when I watched the fight live, I saw like people were bringing like fucking neon signs and then like, oh, those were his fan club. Mm -hmm. And now looking when he actually posted his fights to Instagram <laughs> and he couldn't, and that was when he like outed himself as like, the fight was fixed. I know the guy you're talking about. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, that's one thing. I have respect for anyone who's willing to, but it takes a lot of nuts to get into a, a ring or a cage in yeah. front of thousands of people, cameras, yeah. and fight someone. So I pay respect to anyone willing to get into the ring and compete, but you have to also understand the difference between someone who's had, like myself, had like 25 fights, right? Yeah. So I've been doing this over 10 years. Yeah. So for me to be, for me to tell someone I'm a professional fighter, it's very different than someone who trained boxing for six weeks, took a bunch of Instagram videos, and now he's boxing and he wants to sit on the same level as myself and other professional fighters. It's like, I have the utmost respect for them competing, but you have to realize that it's different. Yeah. Like, I feel like it could almost be the same as like, bro, I play paintball sometimes. I'm not gonna say I was in the military. All ah, right. I wasn't that, in, that, I no, wasn't no, in the war. No, 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 that's, yeah, you know that's, what I mean? it's that's just, a stretch. That's a pretty, uh, a pretty rough analogy, that's, but you yeah. see what I mean, right? Like there's, there's differences and there's levels. 
But what about somebody who like started like say started a, their combat sports career late? What if they realize, okay, like, take for example a 28 year old like me, mm -hmm. and then you decided, fuck it, I'm just I just want to try something new before I die. Mm -hmm. And I train boxing for like say I dedicate myself to boxing training for like one whole year, and finally make my debut against someone from the same levels, another beginner making their debut. Maybe they're younger. Maybe they're 20, 21. Would that would would it suffice for me to call myself a professional boxer at that stage, or would that also be like jumping the gun? Would no, of course, if you have a professional match, you're a professional. There's no, it doesn't matter. I turned pro after about three or four months of training. Oh, so I was technically a pro MMA fighter. It's very inexperienced, but I was technically pro. So no one can take it away from you. But the thing is, is a lot of these people have a million followers oh, on Instagram. Oh, you mean people who already have large followings. Right, so they think that, oh, I like KSI, right? He's some guy from, he's some dork from England or whatever, right? Yeah. He's calling out Conor McGregor like he's on the same level, like he's as accomplished as Conor in fighting. Yeah. It's ludicrous. It's completely stupid. Or And, and Logan Paul for that matter. And he's, exactly. He was like arguing with his brother at one point during the podcast I talked to you about whose name I forget. It was like, could, like I think Jake brought up the point. I was like, dude, what makes you think I'm I'm a better? What makes you think you're a better boxer than me? And Logan just like straight out he says, well, I went I went toe to toe with like Floyd Mayweather and took him the distance. And it was like, no, you didn't. He carried you. <laughs> yeah, Floyd was being nice. Floyd could have finished it whenever. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. But um, that's one of these things. Uh, a lot of these YouTube guys. Like, bro, Logan's on PEDs for sure. Jake's on PEDs, bro. Like, Dude, it's, I, I it's know people so... in the circle, you know what I mean? This isn't a speculation. One, I can look at them and tell sort of what they're taking. And two, I know people around these people. So I know, like, there's a reason why they're denying drug tests. And yeah. there's a reason why they're not trying to do it. And I totally think, like, Logan's in WWE, right? Yeah, they, they, you, they encourage PEDs. You should, bro. If your job is to be a big muscle pussy and carry a chair around and stuff, do roids, bro, because that's going to make you The WWE is like the biggest like culprit in like, you're looking small there. Hey, look, how about <laughs> I give you up a, a supply of steroids? They ruined lives, man. I, I used to love the WWE, but dude, I hate them like later on. Bro, when I was a kid, I was more upset about finding out that WWE was fake than I was about finding out that Santa wasn't real. I was Me like, too. Me I too. Was like, I was and like, and you know, you the mean he's not hitting him with a chair. What the fuck? Like, I was like sad. You know what the sad part is? I when I found out about the WWE being fake, I was fourteen. <laughs> I was that old. Yeah, me too. I think it was just I wanted to believe it. I wanted to believe Triple H really hit him with a sledgehammer. Yeah, and I want to believe that like after you get beat up for like 15 minutes, you can come back in that one final minute and like pin him down, score your like drop the people's elbow or like <laughs> the F U and like just like go for the three second count. But like, yeah, in retrospect, I mean, I still watch pro wrestling because it, it, I consider it as like the same as watching a TV drama. Well, it's entertainment, bro. That's the thing. Yeah. That's the perfect example of like, these fighters like Connor and Sean and stuff, they take, like it's almost, people make the comparison. Yeah. Oh, it's almost WWE now. But I feel, but, yeah, I, I understand you on that part. WWE is the business of selling fights. Yeah. The, no one cares about, no one watches it for the action. It's the spectacle, it's the drama yeah. around it. So I, I would almost advise some people to adopt some of the mannerisms. Obviously, training and fighting is number one. Because if you promote the fight and you get your ass whooped, you're an idiot. Yeah. But promoting yourself at the press conference on Instagram, at these, it is important, bro. And you will make more money from fighting if you do it. Yeah. And I feel like UFC still beats one championship in terms of like promoting fights. Mm -hmm. Like at press conferences, you have like guys going back and forth, throwing expletives at each other. Mm -hmm. But I still feel like, okay, compared to like four years ago, back in 2019, Fighters are more like let loose, mm. especially with the more American fighters coming in. You, you have like the short guy, Jared Brooks. Mm -hmm. You have uh, the Iranian guy, Amir Ali Akbari, who in the heavyweight division, he, he was allowed to like face the heavyweight champ, Anatoly Malikin, and they 
front, it looked as if they were like staging a scuffle in the ring mm -hmm. where Mitch Chilson had to get in between them, but I don't know. It felt forced, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, I think they kind of... But they still have to do more. Yeah, you don't have to entertain people with drama necessarily. Like Colt right now, Colt's doing a great job on Instagram and stuff. We're always doing is just tips. Every day he's posting, here's how to underhook, here's how to do this, yeah. this, this. And it's like, he's gonna gain a lot of attention because one, Colt's one of the best coaches I've ever met. Yeah. So all of those tips he's giving is super valuable. And two, it's like, if you're a young up and coming guy, maybe you don't have access to coaches of that caliber. You can take what you see on his Instagram and you can apply it in your class. And that's not necessarily him creating drama, but drama sells. Yeah. You know, or for girls, sex sells. You might notice all the pretty girl fighters always get the belt. They always get to hold it because they know they're going to be more marketable. The yeah. company knows this and they promote them. Yeah, that's true. Speaking of like selling fights, I wanted to talk about like the man known as TJ Chang, you know? I feel like <laughs> we had to get into this eventually, right? <laughs> I mean, like, say what you will about like his performance in the ring, but like, so far watching BKFC Thailand, I feel like he's the only guy who's like made an effort to like promote, promote his fight at, mm -hmm. at the very least. Mm. So like, I don't know. What's your thoughts on the guy? <laughs> when I met TJ, he was actually a nice guy. He was, he was super polite, respectful to me, gave me a hug and stuff. Great, to, great to see you, bro. What, whatever. So I don't have any personal issue with the guy, but at the same time. He would be a great example of someone who does a great job promoting his fights, doesn't really do a good job fighting. Yeah, that's what you know? I felt. That was my opinion. So like when I watched the second BKFC Thailand event, obviously he was supposed to fight the, that Fabiano guy in the first mm -hmm. event, but like he got flattened in like 30 seconds. <laughs> Anticlimactic ending, if you mm -hmm. ask me. Mm -hmm. But then in the second fight, I don't know, it felt anticlimactic too, because you know, the way they were going back and forth, jawing at each other during the press conference, and like, actually one of them got up and jet, I, I assume it was TJ, because he's the guy with the short fuse. Um, I don't know, the fight felt pretty like, empty, because mm. like, he couldn't finish him, one. Two, like, that Fabiano guy kept like, committing fouls. I don't know why. The double leg takedowns. The double leg right? takedown, the kneeing him with the balls. I don't know, it was, I don't know, it felt so odd. And like TJ couldn't knock him out for, go I don't know why, I don't know. Well, one thing I'm really, <laughs> one thing I'm really interested to see, TJ is obviously gonna do another great job promoting his upcoming fight. Yeah. And then he's gonna get knocked out by Chris. Dude, Chris, man. Chris, Chris has been through, he's, what, what, what did you say he did in the military? Chris is a German special forces sniper. He, I watched Chris fight on King of the Street, which is bare knuckle MMA on concrete. It's not even MMA, it's like actual street fighting. It's just fighting. a street, bro, you're allowed to eye gouge, you can pull the hair. You can stomp they, on somebody's head. Yeah, soccer kick, there's a photo of Chris soccer kicking the guy in the face. And it, and good thing for the guy that it didn't actually land flush, cause. Mm, that would have been a, a different story, but the guy had really long dreads, right? Yeah, yeah, And he yeah. taped them all together like a yeah. big Yeah, I saw knot. that. Chris just used it as a handle and started just starting the lawnmower yeah, off, and just ripping him. Yeah. And it's like, okay, so Chris is a special guy. I cornered Chris when he fought left way. I've seen him fight King of the Street, which is just an organized street fight in yeah. an undisclosed location in Europe. He's got, I think, 60 Muay Thai fights, a couple MMA fights. Chris is a real fucking special guy. He's like a really good fighter. And Chris actually and, fought like a high level kickboxer from Glory in his MMA in one of his MMA fights, Myrtle Grunhart, even yeah. though he lost. He, I kind of wanted him to win, but like, you know, I, I half expected, you know, Chris has more MMA experience, but it is what it is. Chris is a, a legitimate savage fighter. And TJ is well, like as good as he is at promoting, and he looks the part, he's got the tattoos that make him look kind of like and the, curious Aquaman, you know, like all this And all the this 19th shit. century mustache, which I've personally, I don't, I don't think it, goes well, I don't know what they, he was thinking. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't know where he gets his style from, but like, if he thinks that doing blow and having tattoos is gonna help him beat Chris, he's got another thing coming. Chris is gonna kill him. Dude, man. So I like, wanna play this back after. Yeah, sure. And be like, I told you. 
<laughs> so like Chris was actually one of the OGs I first met at Marrow 2, along with Jackie Boy here. <laughs> and yeah, he was like this really tall dude. He looks he super scary. And then I realized the first, yeah, and I realized like it wasn't the first time I'd seen Chris because I first saw him on Left Way Championship mm -hmm. on UFC Fight Pass. I was like, why does this dude look so familiar? And then Jeremy and his wife Chesla told me later, like, Chris, oh, Chris fights a lot of styles, you know? He, does, mm -hmm. he do, doesn't only do Muay Thai, but he's also fought left way and bare knuckle. And I was like, Chris does left way? Mm -hmm. And so I like replayed the playback on like, UFC Fight Pass and I was like, Christoph Kirsch. And I was like, oh my God, I've seen this guy before. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I actually cornered Chris for that fight and I'm cornering him for his BKFC fight. So this is going to be a great weekend, bro. What are your thoughts on the Borkal Sancho event? Honestly, that I'm torn. I'm honestly torn. Like. The pure side of me is like, dude, come on. Like, Nick, if you're watching this, why, man? Why? <laughs> they're, they're old, they're retired, they're living legends, man. Just let them be at peace. But then there's this morbid curiosity side of me where I want to see, the part of me that wants to see things burn. So imagine like a Ferrari, a fancy, the highest end Ferrari you can think of, the fastest one. And then the, on the other end is a Lamborghini, fastest one, higher end coming from opposite directions, full speed, and they're about to crash. You want to look away, but you can't because you want to see which one's the stronger car. Which is going to hold up more, right? Yeah, it's like that. That part of me that wants to see the world burn. Yeah. I think there was a lot of speculation about the fight because people were also saying, because they're friends. Yeah. Like, it would they, be like me and Colt fighting. Yeah. You know, we're close friends, we train together a lot. Uh, I, they put in the rules a stipulation there can be no draw there must be a winner declared yeah and i think that was the only thing they could do to stop it from being a spectacle yeah because if it were me and colt fighting for a lot of money colt's one of my best friends but we already joked around we're like we'd, we'd spar for millions of dollars yeah who cares big deal you know and so i think they're having there must be a winner declared it's the only way to ensure that it's a legitimate fight yeah the other thing the Borkal poke Sancho in the eye at the at the weigh-in I sent it to Colt and I was like hey bro like you know you're my friend right yeah but if you fucking poke me in the eye <laughs> it's on like no and what they didn't tell you uh after Borkal poked Sancho in the eye Nick t told them to go hey guys it's time to sign gloves that we're doing for giveaways mm -hmm. <laughs> when Borkal is signing Sancho comes up and hits him with one of the gloves <laughs> and then like it's, it's, it's all quiet for a while, but then Borkow's about to leave. Sanchai is like busy talking to the press. Borkow comes up to him and with a glove, and then he just <laughs> fucking runs away. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, maybe like, I don't know, maybe they, they're gonna have like a gentleman's agreement, like behind like closed doors, like, hey dude, you take it easy, I'll take it easy on you too. Some shit like that. Mm. Yeah, I think, I don't see it being a finish. Just purely because if I was fighting a close friend of mine, yeah, I'd fight hard. I'd, I'd want to win the fight, but I'm not trying to damage my just friend. Carry just carry it, especially when borkal has got to fight Pacquiao and he's got to fight. A yeah, that's Coda. what. Yeah, like he's got a lot of high-profile fights. Exactly. If he gets knocked out by Sanchai, it's he's not going to fight Pacquiao. You yeah. know what I mean? That costs a lot of money. So I already made my predictions. So like. I'm pretty sure since it's like special tie rules, which is code for bare knuckle Muay Thai, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure Sanchai wins this and like, okay, he may not get the finish. Um, he's probably gonna like, just like toy around with Bull Cow for like five rounds. Mm -hmm. And he's probably gonna pull out the decision. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's just my thoughts. Yeah, I, to be honest, I don't watch Muay Thai enough. I haven't watched their fights enough yeah. to have a specific opinion. Yeah. All I know is that um, I've only ever bumped into Borkal a couple of times. Oh, hey, bro, whatever. But I had Sanchai cooking soup at our house one time when we were living at the gym. Him and Super Bon and all the boys come to see Pipa at the gym. And um, yeah, Gal Fairtex and they were all. Yeah. Bro, Sanchai cooks like the spiciest mala ever. Oh. I was like, I was like, no wonder you're so tough, bro. I'm crying, trying, trying to eat his dinner, you know. So. So I have to pick Sanchai just because I wouldn't say that we're close friends, but I have, I've had him at our house for dinner. So I have to pick him. I've worked with Sanchai before when I was in Thai fights. So yeah, I mean, he kind of recognized me. He was like, oh, did we used to go on like shoots together? And I was like, yeah, oh, you kind of <laughs> look familiar. And I'm like, 
Well, thank you for remembering me. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's the best. He's nice. Yeah, but yeah. No, I'm gonna pick. I'm gonna pick Sanchai. And like, <laughs> like, there's no, no, no easy way to say this. Nick did admit on like a Q and A that he paid them like a hefty amount of money. So like, uh, a guy from the Pattaya News, he looked up like how much Rod Tang was being paid in one championship, and it was three hundred fifty thousand US dollars. Nick said. Nick said before that um, he's not allowed under contract to say how much the amount of money the, he was paying to the fighters. So when the guy from the Pattaya News looked up Rod Tang's three hundred fifty thousand dollars, he said, "Is that is that more or less than what they're being paid?" Wait, is yeah. So basically, what Nick said was, "It's more than what Rod Tang is being paid by one." So I mean, that's a lot of money. I think it, it'd be hard for Bull Cow to turn out knowing him. What I've been told, I used to get personal training sessions from like a former stable mate of his, who is a former professional boxer. Like when they used to train at like the poor Premuk camp, like Bokao is poor at financial management. Mm -hmm. So like, I wouldn't be surprised if he burns through the his purse like before the end of the year. <laughs> yeah, I think. Yeah, I don't know anything about their personal finances, of course, but um, I do think they're both getting older. They, They're yeah. both. This fight should have happened ten years ago. Yeah. Fifteen years ago, perhaps. Yeah. But what do you think people can do if they're an older competitor or they're an injured fighter or something? What do you think there is a place for PEDs in in fighting? What What do you think would justify PED use as a fighter? Is it out of competition to help with recovery? Like we've had some recent incidents at one. Yeah. Or do you think it's ever okay or it's never possible? <sighs> Or it's okay if they're open about it. What do you think is? Look, sometimes I used to. Be, I'm. I'm actually. I used to be like for PEDs for like out of competition for recovery. Mm -hmm. But this kickboxer named Gabriel Varga. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he used to. He used to like fight this Muay Thai fighter named Lerzela, and he actually beat him because. But like that, which was a big deal because Lerzela was like one of the best technical fighters. My point is. Um, Gabriel Varga said, I mean, if you're using PEDs for recovery and like recovering to go back to fight, it's not exactly fair because mm -hmm. like, let's assume everybody else is natural like and like also recovering without PEDs. Mm -hmm. you're, you still have an edge, you still have an unfair advantage. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to say, I mean, Personally, I think like PEDs could only be justified now. Now that I've seen Gabriel Varga's video, I feel mm -hmm. like PEDs can can only be justified once you're done fighting, like mm -hmm. to heal all that wear and tear on your body. Right. Yeah, I definitely. As a competitor myself, I think that there should be two divisions. Yeah. I think there should be the only natural division where like people are openly stringently tested and things like this properly and it's easy to get around the tests and stuff so they should it would have to be like or more of a moral obligation and i think they should also just be the free for all take whatever you want circus and just go crazy and be a monster but i i wouldn't have a problem fighting someone who's using peds if they tell you hey bro i'm taking this 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 do you accept the fight? Yeah. Okay, at least now I know. Because something like uh, John Jones, Daniel Cormier. John Jones knocks him out, boom, head kick, stops him. Then he pops for PEDs, and the question then arises in Daniel Cormier's head, would that have happened? If he wasn't on the gear. If he wasn't on gear, you know? And so that's sort of robbing people of their... Same with TJ Dillashaw on EPO, mm -hmm. when he beat Cody Garbrandt twice. Mm. Yeah, I know, like, it's so many what ifs. Like, would this fight have played out differently had he not been on PEDs? The other thing is, I don't think that you're ever gonna completely abolish the use of PEDs. Absolutely it is not. so easy for people to pass the test, especially here in Asia, they don't test anything. Yeah. UFC have USADA, but even for guys like in Russia or Brazil, the USADA guys go to Russia. They do? Yeah, they, they'll, if you're in the UFC, you have to have your whereabouts oh, at, at all times. Oh, you mean for the UFC? Right. Oh yeah, because you're under contract with the UFC. That's why these guys, these uh, 
commission guys, they travel to Russia, to Brazil, right. test them at their gyms, test them in their homes. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, they arrive at the airport. Mm. They go, what are you here for? Business. What do you do? I work for USADA. Who are you here to test? It could be, okay, oh, your visa had a problem for three days, four days. Okay, now you can go. They actually do that? Yeah, of course. And then they get there and they, because the compounds that they take have a, like a 24 hour, 48 hour life. So if you can just hold off for a day or two, it's out of your system, they test clean, they go back. To, like it's, it's so, easy. You mean after one day, it will still be in your system, correct? No. Some, some compounds have like a 12 hour half life. Take it in the morning, in the afternoon, you test it good. I and will keep that in mind. <laughs> the other thing that a lot of people don't know about is that um, if people have enough money, they can order custom compounds. So you can get a doctor and it would be the same as like, let's say, uh, I don't know all the names of all the things, but you take one kind of steroid, right? Yeah. And you start to go, okay, that's illegal, boom. And they just change one molecule, does the exact same thing, but they can't test for it because it's not technically the same compound. It's legal, they take it, same performance enhancing benefits, they fine. So PEDs aren't going anywhere. And so I think people should just be more open. If they are on PEDs, they should tell their opponent, they should tell people and obviously stay away from them. Like yeah. if, if you want to be honorable and whatever, yeah, don't take them yeah. or at least be open about it. So like on the topic of like, PEDs mm -hmm. brings me to testosterone. Do you feel like using testosterone, like you know, during, especially in the UFC TRT era, mm -hmm. did you think that was like that was justifiable, or like yeah, they should have gotten rid of it? Mm. That's a tough one. I do understand that. Um, so what happens is if you had low testosterone, you could take enough tests to get it up to the limit. Yeah. So technically, it regulated everyone's testosterone at 900 or something, which is much higher than the average person, but that was the limit. The problem then becomes is people would take other steroids, Anovar, Debol, these kind of steroids, yeah. and then they come off them, their testosterone dips, they go to the doctor, hey, I got a low test, I need a prescription, they take tests, get it up to, so they're keeping all their gains from the other steroids they were taking, and then they're testing clean for TRT, and then they fight. Because you can tell if Vitor, he's always the case study example, right? Yeah, TRT, Vitor. He was a machine, right? And you see him now, he's on TRT, but just test. He, they go, like, he's not the same, he's not the same person. Yeah. So I think, uh, I understand what they mean. Everyone's got the same test levels, but at the same time, you have to understand it's not natural. It couldn't be considered natural. But then again, what is? Is creatine, is protein, is what is natural these days. Okay, now, if guys can take tests, this beg brings me into another question. They can also take estrogen, right? Uh, yeah, I guess so, I don't know why. But like, trans, trans transgender MMA fighters, they take estrogen, right? <laughs> uh, they either take estrogen or it would be like a test suppressant. So they get their test levels to a female level, which seems counterintuitive if you want to be a, a, a fighter. But I, it's a hairy subject, but I reckon, um, yeah, bro, if you're born a dude, you should fight dudes. Here in Thailand, the lady boys, the transgender men that are women, they fight men. You know, Nong Rose is a great example. I've met Nong Rose. Her arms look like mine. Oh, shit. She's a girl. <laughs> yeah, no, she got the hammers, bro. She, she's got hammers, you know yeah. what I mean? And I seen her knock out dudes. Yeah. Boom. And so it's like, bro, for her to fight a girl, completely unfair. But here in Thailand, they recognize it. Yeah. They go, yeah, cool. You're a dude. Yeah, nice singlet, bro. You're fighting a nice bra. You're fighting dudes. Which would be a different case if she were in the United States, because like sporting commissions would would like say that, oh, so you identify as a woman? Here, here you go. You fight a woman as in the same weight class as you, I reckon. Which would be another controversial topic. 
<laughs> yeah. And the internet would put her on blast. So me and Wonder Girl fight in the same weight class. Right. Wonder Girl, Nat Jarun's hot. I, Nat's a very good friend of ours and I love Nat to death. She's great. But we fight, I'm way bigger than her. Men can cut more weight because they have more muscle mass and things like this. Right. So if you see us standing beside each other, men and women, it's completely different. Two completely different people. We should not be competing together. Yeah. Nat's probably a much more technical Muay Thai fighter than I am too. She's incredibly good. I'm a, I shouldn't have even brought Nat up because she's a close friend. I don't want us to come across as me. It's not at all. Yeah. But we just happen to fight in the same weight class. Yeah. And I don't think men and women should ever compete against each other. Never. Like if I was to put on a nice sports bra and go kick the shit out of some girl, I, I could probably kill a girl if I hit her with full force, bro. You know what I mean? And so I think it's disgusting that yeah. men are competing in women's sports. I understand swimming or whatever, no one's getting injured. You're ripping them off, you're ruining their dreams and everything, which is completely terrible, but no one's getting concussive brain yeah. issues. No, but what I take issue with is like, there's these men who like have had like decades of experience, you know, like these weightlifters, these swimmers, they've had decades of experience. It's not like they transitioned before they developed, you know, their, you know, fully developed hormones, got undergone puberty and all that. And okay, when they were men, they were ranked like what, 500th, 700th in the world. <laughs> and then now that they're women, they decide to like, they decide to like go full force and now they're like number one record holder in the world. That's what I take issue with. Bro, I would be the toughest chick ever. <laughs> like, I, and I, <laughs> I totally agree with you. <laughs> Bro, like, Unless you fought that uh, guy, that, I forget his name, her name, his name, whatever, whatever. Okay, uh, uh, yeah, Gabby Garcia is a different story. No, oh yeah, Gabby Garcia is a different case. Juiced out uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt uh, who fought in Ryzen. She might beat me. She, dude, she's like going? she's like walking around she's like 240 pounds which is like 110 kilograms ridiculous no but like my point is there was like this case of like a former u.s soldier who like did tours in afghanistan mm -hmm. he decided to transition to become a woman mm. fought a woman basically like broke her face yeah just like what the fuck man? disgusting there's a guy fell on Fox or whatever, fractured that girl's skull. Yeah, and I'm so glad Ashley Evan Smith, like, finally beat him. Mm. And Ty Emery, if you're ever watching this video, please thank Ashley Evan Smith for me, if you have the chance, for beating Fallon. Because, my God, somebody had to. I think Ty would beat the fuck out of Fallon, too. Yeah. Ty is so good. I remember watching the fight where Fallon Fox got beat, and somebody in the crowd was screaming, Kick him in the nuts! <laughs> that was so funny. Yeah, that would be... Would, do you reckon that would make it fair? A man fights a woman with a chick, it, uh, he's not allowed to wear a cup. She can kick him in the dick if she wants. That might make it fair, that right? Might, that would even the playing ground. A little bit. Yeah, <laughs> a little just bit. a little bit. Uh, yeah, it could work. Yeah. I think, um... Yeah, I think it's just a ridiculous idea. Just... You know, the only, the only promotion that would like host like man versus woman fights is Fight Circus. I mean, they've done that before, have they? Mm, I think they have. Uh, yeah, they, I think they had a man and woman before. BJJ competition, I believe. But um, yeah, I would, actually, Fight Circus is cool, bro. I've had a couple offers from them. Yeah, what kind I mean, of matches? What kind of matches? One was a schoolyard match. So they want me to wear a backpack and a tie and a school uniform. Yeah. And you're going at it like lunchtime, you know? <laughs> so like an MMA and, fight, but like you're wearing costumes. But yeah, basically like a school uniform and a backpack and a cap and, and you're gonna fight like two school kids. And I was like, yo, this is where my career started. I was like, I'm gonna have to bring out the old title from my high school, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah. Not that. And um, you ever heard of chess boxing? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I play chess a lot, bro. I play chess every day. Yeah. And I'm not like good or anything, but like I, I got some moves, you know? Yeah. And um, we were talking about doing the first ever chess MMA fight. And I was like, if I don't get checkmate, I'm just shooting a double straight away. Yeah. And I was like, I could be open to that. You know, I felt, I feel like uh, Fight Circus should do chess MMA. Mm. It's like, like, I know chess boxing is supposed to be like, 
how how good you can adapt between like physical and mental but mm-hmm. like chess mma would be like taking it to the next Even level more, in the right? physical aspect i don't believe it's been done yet and i think i'm the guy for the job yeah i don't know who wants to fight me in chess mma <laughs> I don't even know if you do chess first or you do MMA first. Cause I think it starts with chess. I, it starts with the fight first, the MMA first. Oh, we're not making it to chess. <laughs> <laughs> John Nutt, if you're hearing this, chess MMA. John Nutt, we on. <laughs> no, I'll say, so like, I'm on, so fight circus. What, speaking of which, whatever happened to Full Metal Dojo, you know, with all their like regular MMA shows? I mean, I used to watch their replays, but, and they were pretty good. The Full like, Metal Dojo was great. I used to love, <laughs> uh, I cornered Javier and Colt when they fought Full Metal Dojo. And um, they were like, you know normally the crowd seated back from the cage? Yeah. Nah. They were like fighting and Colt and stuff were like on the corner of the fence. And people were putting their fingers through grabbing them. <laughs> Cause like it was held in a nightclub, right? Yeah, it was held in Insanity on Soy 11. Yeah. Which, um, yeah, which is cool. I, I would like to see more regional shows because at the moment, uh, the only regional MMA shows that we have to sort of build up fighters is CFC, which is mine and Nick Lee's show, and Legend occasionally. Yeah, Legend has been like sporadical at mm. best. Yeah, uh, inconsistent because the politicians have stuff they got to do and that kind of carry on. But I think one of the things is, especially with us doing CFC, me and Nick, is we are building the grassroots level fighters up to engineer their careers yeah. because at the moment it's like in Thailand or in this area of Asia you got 1FC, Fairtex, but they won't sign you if you don't have fights and that means you're going to have to fly somewhere else and if you're getting flown to another country to fight you're yeah. going there to lose. Yeah. So it was what we found especially for these local Thai fighters and local beginner MMA guys it was difficult for them to get their careers off the ground because right. they were getting flown elsewhere to take losses. Yeah, because like they're fighting more experienced guys, right? Right, well of course, well, if you're the promoter and you've got a guy at your gym, you want him to win, right? So you fly someone in. Correct. So that was kind of, they're getting sort of fed to the lambs a little bit. And so what we're trying to do with CFC is we want to be able to get our local guys, Bangkok, Phuket, our yeah. local Thailand based fighters, and we want to put them together so that they have a platform to build themselves and we also want to promote them. Like uh, you'll see on our on our Instagram page, we're not promoting CFC, we're promoting these guys. We're promoting yeah. the younger, like Toby. Toby McNerlin, Cole, that guy has um, done like boxing, has done MMA, yeah. But Toby's one, gonna be one of the next big things, bro. He's young, he's like 17 or something like that. Yeah. And he fights all the time, he trains really hard. And so we're trying to build these guys up to give them a platform to step to UFC. We've got a couple guys to UFC already. We got um, some guys going to one, and so we're just trying to get the next level of, we're trying to help the guys level up, because if you don't compete, you don't improve, right? Right. But like, how does CFC like distinguish which fights are AMI and pro? This is what I've been wondering for a while. Like, okay, it's like, so the last event they had, Homeland 2, it was like, the majority of the card was like AMI fights, and then like, I feel, I feel like two of them were like pro fights. Yeah, mm-hmm. how, how did they distinguish? So realistically, it's up to the fighter and the fighter's coach to decide if they want to be amateur or pro. Once you turn pro, you can't go back to amateur. Right. But especially, like I said, we're, we're a grassroots promotion. We're not a big, huge money, huge budget. You're not show. one, you're not fair text fight. Uh. Right. But the thing is, is like, where are you going to have your first fight? Your first five fights, 10 fights. You're not going to get to one with less than 10 fights. You know, you're not going to get to Fairtex or something. And so we have to build up these amateur guys to see their career to turn pro. So the idea is like we want to have obviously some pro guys, pro belts, things like this. But at the same time, we have to start the amateur guys off and give them a platform to build themselves. Mm, I see. (sighs) Interesting. So like when's the next event again, like for CFC? So we haven't, uh, we haven't locked the complete date in yet, but we're looking around the end of the year. So end of the year is gonna be great. We got uh, BKFC, we have CFC, probably the following week or two after that. And so it's gonna be a busy end of the year for 
combat sports here in Thailand especially. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's it for so far. We may even try to squeeze in two events before the end of the year if we can. A big one, because we're trying to aim towards bigger broadcasting, and then another small one just to wrap up the year. But I did hear that Nick was aiming to bring CFC to UFC Fight Pass. Mm -hmm. Does he have like a lock on like who the commentators will be yet? Because I do remember, the, I, don't, I don't, was it like one of the first C, like actual flagship CFC events? There was this YouTuber named Fight Commentary Breakdowns. He was like a com commentator. I forget who the other guy was, but like, yeah. But does he have a lock on who commentators will be or all that? Or is just, or nothing set in stone yet? Uh, as far as commentators for the event, I'm not sure. If I'm not fighting, we can do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, why not? Yeah. We can commentate, bro, for sure. We're just going to have to, it'll be like Chris and Colt just beating people up and we'll be like, oh, there goes Colt choking someone out again. <laughs> so that, that, that's like fight circus vibes. No, for real. Yeah. All right. Yeah, it's going to be pretty busy end of the year, bro. But um, tell me, is there anything else that you wanted to go over? Anything you got on your mind regarding combat sports here in Thailand right now? Yeah, I think, I guess that's about it for today. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thanks for having me on, bro. It's been a pleasure being Dude, here. Thanks. First guy to feature on the podcast, so that's a, that's a big thing for me. So it's a pleasure, and thank you, bro. Thanks for your time. A look into the mind of a foreign fighter in <laughs> Thailand. I want to do this for a long time. All right, so if any of you who've made it this far, please don't forget to hit like and subscribe. And for those of you still watching, I wish you all good morning, good afternoon, and good night. <laughs>